Welcome to Data Domain Implementation with Application Software. Click the Notes tab to view text that corresponds to the audio recording. Click the Resources tab to download a PDF version of this e-learning. This course covers the implementation of data domain systems in backup environments using a variety of backup applications such as EMC Networker and Avamar, Veritas Net Backup and Backup Exec, IBM Spectrum Protect, and Oracle RMAN. This module focuses on a number of key concepts involved in the implementation of EMC data domain systems with application software. Upon completion of this module, you should be able to describe implementation concepts, terms, architectures, data flow and DDBoost implementations, backups over Ethernet and Fiber Channel, and implementation workflows. This lesson covers basic data domain concepts and terms and product-specific backup terminology. This slide presents a general overview of implementation architectures that combine backup software solutions listed down the left side of the table with a NAS or Network Attached Storage Environment or a SAN or Storage Area Network Environment. These environments utilize one or more of the protocols listed along the top and might also include the DD Boost option. The data domain system integrates into any of these configurations as indicated by the check marks. For a complete listing of all backup applications supported by Data Domain, consult the Backup Compatibility Guide at http colon slash slash compatibilityguide.emc.com colon 8080 slash comp guide app. This slide provides a brief review of basic terminology associated with the backup environment. In all configurations, there are clients that need to be backed up, a server that manages these backups, a server that writes to and reads from backup targets, and the backup target themselves. In some environments, the backup management and read-write functions are performed on a single server. Networking connectivity can be via Ethernet LAN or Fiber Channel SAN. The networker environment shown here adds the concept of the networker data zone, encompassing these network devices. The networker clients generate the backup data, while the networker server manages the backup traffic. Specifically, the networker server supports the backup and stores tracking and configuration information. Networker storage nodes write data to and read data from backup targets. Another way to define a networker data zone is to say that it is the set of hosts managed by a single networker server. This includes all hosts with backup devices controlled by the networker server and all hosts who send their backup data to those devices. Networker clients may be backed up by multiple networker servers and therefore may belong to multiple data zones. Networker servers and storage nodes may belong to only one data zone. In large networker environments, storage nodes serve as an aggregation point for a large number of clients. The clients send their data to the storage node with which they are associated, and the storage node backs up the data to the storage. Specific backup software products introduce specific terminology. In a net backup or backup exec environment, for example, the server that manages backups is called the master server, while media servers write to and read from backup targets. Spectrum Protect environments employ similar technology. These are some product-specific terms that apply to implementations of IBM Spectrum Protect. Backup and Archive Clients BA clients, are computers and servers that send or retrieve data from the Spectrum Protect server. 
The Spectrum Protect server's main function is to coordinate movement of the backup and archive data from the BA clients to the storage media. The Spectrum Protect database keeps track of each new transaction and its recovery logs. In case of sudden outage of the Spectrum Protect server, recovery logs are the first resort to revert back changes and get the database back to an operational stage. Storage pools are collections of like media, tape or disk based. Spectrum Protect allows you to build a hierarchy of storage pools as destinations for specific backup, archive and migration data. ComVault Sampana software is a data protection suite for large-scale enterprises. The first Sampana system installed must be configured as a ComServe. A ComServe defines a backup domain called ComCell that manages members, clients, media agents, and data protection storage resources. The ComServe contains an SQL database that keeps track of the various agents and data protection metadata, such as the media index. A ComVault Media Agent Server is any system, including the ComServe, that has the iData Media Agent installed. This lesson covers backup and recovery with and without data domain and the advantages of using data domain. The basic flow of data in a backup and recovery environment runs as follows. The full range of systems that might require their data to be backed up can include LAN clients, Windows and Unix servers, databases, and VMware servers. The backup traffic gets routed through the servers that write to storage, in this example, a tape library. In this case, tapes are rotated out of the tape library and are shipped via trucks to an off-site location. The tapes are stored so the data can be recovered in case of a disaster at the primary site. The metadata associated with the backup is stored with the backup server managing the environment. The metadata is instrumental to the backup system's ability to quickly locate and restore data. With tape library storage systems, data is sometimes stored on staging disks called the primary disk pool. It is then migrated to the physical tape library or primary tape pool. The primary tape pool is copied and moved off-site called the copy tape pool. As a result, up to three copies of the data must be tracked in some situations. The primary disk pool, the primary tape pool, and the copy tape pool. A data domain system integrates as the primary storage destination for deduplicated and compressed backups. In this example, Data Domain System A, DDSA, is the primary destination for backups at the headquarters while Data Domain System B, DDSB, is the primary destination for backups at the off-site location. Data can be replicated from the headquarters location to the off-site location via the WAN, preserving a copy at a different location. The Data Domain System B can also act as the primary target for backups for clients located at the secondary site. By implementing data domain systems, the tape library configuration becomes optional. Company policies or the need for regulatory compliance both determine the degree to which tapes can be entirely or partially replaced at a site. Some sites may also choose to use data domain replication to partially or completely eliminate the transportation of tapes by truck for vaulting. By replacing some or all of a company's reliance on tape backups with deduplicated storage of data on disk, customers can reduce costs, complexity, and the risks associated with tape. The key advantages of implementing the data domain system are reduction in the overall size and scope of the backup and recovery infrastructure, 
elimination or reduction of the time and resources needed to create, transport, and reclaim physical tape, reduction of the number of copies that need to be tracked, thereby reducing backup server database sizes while increasing performance, increased speed of disaster recovery, This lesson covers NAS versus SAN environments, VTL and Networker, NetBackup slash Backup Exec, Spectrum Protect, and Protect Point environments. Data domain systems support two integration methods, either in a NAS or network attached storage environment, via network file system mounts, or as a standalone virtual tape library, VTL in a SAN or storage area network configuration. For network file system access in a NAS environment, the backup software addresses the data domain system via native NFS mounts or SIFS shares. The backup software addresses the usable space exactly as it would a standard file system mount point such as NTFS, JFS, UFS, and so on. In a VTO or SAN environment, typically, prior investments have usually been in tape, either physical or virtual. Administrators who know how to manage, monitor, and configure SAN environments can adopt the data domain system as a virtual tape library more easily. Data domain systems can run in a mixed mode capacity, providing both interface methods concurrently to one or many servers. This flexibility affords a great number of integration scenarios. In the case of Networker, administrators already using Networker Advanced File Type Devices AFTDs, can adopt the data domain system as a file system without significant infrastructure or mindset change. The Networker AFTDs accept concurrent streams, writing them into separate files in the directory structure of the AFTD. For VTL implementations, use the Networker Device Manager drivers to interface with the VTL Library Changer with little policy change. For VTL implementations, use the Restore-L180 or DDVTL drive emulation. This allows the backup software to interface with the VTL library changer. There is little policy or procedural changes if the data domain system is used to replace a physical tape library. For NAS configuration of Spectrum Protect, configure file class device via NFS or SIFS exports from the data domain system. Note that you cannot use Spectrum Protect's disk device class type with the data domain system. Only use file device class type. This topic is covered in greater depth in an upcoming module. In a VTL configuration, the data domain system can be a primary or copy pool target. Use the L180 emulation. This table shows trade-offs between the data domain system configured as a file system versus a VTL. This table continues with additional trade-offs between the data domain system configured as a file system versus a VTL. Protect Point requires both IP and fiber channel connections between various components. Fiber channel connections are needed between the read-write server and primary storage for regular business operations. Fiber channel connections are also needed between the primary storage and the data domain in order to perform backups and recoveries. The read-write server needs IP connections to the data domain to communicate and initiate jobs on the data domain.
This lesson covers installation and configuration workflow, administration and operation workflow, DD Boost and Protect Point workflows, and VTL implementation workflow. Data domain implementations all follow a similar workflow. To successfully integrate the data domain system into a backup environment, first perform the basic installation and configuration tasks shown in the diagram. In the first step, make certain that all installations have occurred, including installation of all application software as necessary throughout the environment, and installation and initial configuration of the data domain system for proper network access by client systems and backup servers. Steps 2 and 3 are typically performed by implementation engineers. In the second step, configure the data domain system with the correct networking and create a backup user. Third, configure the backup server with the necessary credentials or other settings as necessary and create a share on the data domain system. Once the communication between the backup environment and the data domain system is established, you administer and operate the data domain system and backup servers in order to validate the implementation. These steps are typically performed by implementation engineers. First, perform administrative tasks on the backup system's administrative console in order to create a backup job. Next, you run and monitor the backup job in the backup system's administrative console. You can also perform operations to perform backup recovery for a client system. And finally, you can validate and analyze the backups within the Data Domain System Manager where you can view statistics and reports. To implement DD Boost, you first prepare both the data domain systems and the backup application. Continue with the DD Boost implementation by verifying backup and clone functionality. Configuring the DD Boost environment to utilize ProtectPoint for application backups and restores can be summarized with a few additional steps. First, install the ProtectPoint application agent. You must set up the configuration file to be used for backups and restores with the database application agent. Customize the configuration file template the software installation provides by setting specific parameters in the file. Next, install Solutions Enabler. If using VMAX 3, to allow the agent to communicate with primary storage. If using Extreme I.O., ProtectPoint will use its own CLI included with the application agent. Then complete the required application-specific configurations according to the appropriate configuration instructions. Next, ensure the primary storage is enabled for snapshots and external storage mounts. For VMAX 3, Fast.x provides the Federated Tier Storage FTS ability to attach external storage and Snap VX for the local snapshot technology. For Extreme I.O. 4.0, utilize the Generation 5 Recover Point appliance instead. Finally, create VDISs on the data domain to serve as block storage devices for backups and restores. Unique data is written to the VDISs by the primary storage snapshot technology. Data Domain uses its fast copy process to copy the data in the VDISC to a long-term archive location in a static image.
The workflow for a VTL implementation varies. In most environments, FC zoning and HBA card installation and configuration will have been previously completed. Steps 3 through 5 are typically performed by implementation engineers and cover configuration of the data domain system, device discovery and configuration on the backup system's administrative console, followed by performance of normal backup administration and operation. This module focused on implementation architectures, implementation concepts and terminology, DD Boost implementations, data flow, Ethernet versus fiber channel environments, and basic implementation workflow. This module focuses on various options and procedures for EMC data domain implementation in a CIFS NFS environment utilizing any of the common backup applications. Upon completion of this module, you will be able to install and implement in a CIFS NFS environment and administer and operate backup applications in a CIFS NFS environment, describe EMC recommended best practices for CIFS and NFS servers, and perform an NFS implementation with IBM Spectrum Protect. This lesson covers various options and procedures for EMC data domain implementation in a CIFS environment utilizing any of the common backup applications. Upon completion of this lesson, you will be able to install and implement in a CIFS environment and administer and operate backup applications in a CIFS environment. To successfully integrate the data domain system with the backup environment, you will perform installation and configuration steps as detailed on this slide. Proper installation and configuration are essential for proper communication. In the first step, make certain that all installations have occurred, including installation of all application software as necessary throughout the environment, and installation and initial configuration of the data domain system for proper network access by client systems and backup servers. Steps 2 and 3 are typically performed by implementation engineers. In the second step, configure the data domain system with the correct networking and create a backup user. Third, configure the backup server with the necessary credentials or other settings as necessary and create a share on the data domain system. All backup application software should be previously been installed. If necessary, complete all installations according to the manufacturer's instructions. Start by installing the backup server component, then optionally install any media server you may want to use, and finally, install all the required backup client components. Verify that the CIFS configuration of the data domain system meets the basic requirements allowing proper access. For example, backup systems should be able to map a network drive to the data domain system backup directory. The requirements are, the data domain system must use either the active directory or workgroup authentication mode. The data domain system must have a valid CIFS user account with the following minimum permissions. If the account is part of a domain or active directory, it must have at least domain backup operator plus local administrator permissions. If the account is in a work group, it must have at least backup operation group permissions. Once the communication between the backup environment and the data domain system is established, you will administer and operate the data domain system and backup servers in order to validate the implementation with the steps shown. Perform administrative tasks on the backup system's administrative console in order to create a backup job. 1. Run and monitor the backup job in the backup system's administrative console. 2. Perform operations to perform backup recovery for a client system. 3. You can validate and analyze the backups within the Data Domain System Manager where you can view statistics and reports.
This lesson covers various options and procedures for ENC data domain implementation in an NFS environment. Upon completion of this lesson, you will be able to describe implementation for NFS, describe data domain networking and NFS parameters, and describe backup server NFS configurations. All backup application software should have previously been installed during step 1. If necessary, complete all installations according to the manufacturer's instructions. Picking up with steps 2 and 3, after the backup software has already been installed, the goal is to establish communication between the data domain system and the backup server in an NFS environment. In step 2, the data domain system must be configured for networking with NFS, and in step 3, the backup server must be configured for backups with NFS mounts. This slide shows the high-level task list for configuring the data domain system for network connectivity and enabling the backup transport protocol for NFS. Establish an SSH session to the data domain system. Run config setup to launch the installation wizard. Configure networking parameters based on your environment. Configure NFS parameters and set backup server list equals asterisk. Set backup server list equal asterisk. If the data domain system is not on the network, for example, if it doesn't have an IP address, you have to directly connect to the data domain system via the serial console to manage the data domain system. Configure the data domain system NFS parameters. Configure the backup server list by typing an asterisk. This allows for any host on the network to connect to the data domain system via NFS. To lock specific hosts, replace the asterisk with a specific host name or an IP address. Once the networking and NFS parameters procedure is completed, verify access to the data domain slash backup and slash ddvar directories through an NFS mount. The goal is to create a mount on the backup server and copy a test file to the data domain system. The diagram shows the high-level task list flow. Create mount points directories. Mount data domain directories on the new mount points. Modify slash etc slash fs tab to mount directories at every boot. Create a backup directory on the net backup server. Once the NFS mount procedure is completed, create and copy the file from the server to the data domain backup directory to validate functionality. Note, the specific commands differ depending on the platform you are running. Always refer to the documentation for the specific commands for each platform. The detailed procedures are to create mount points or directories using the commands shown, then mount data domain directories on the new mount points. Example commands and parameters are shown. Next, modify slash etsy slash fs tab to mount directories at every boot. Finally, create a backup directory on the net backup server. The specific commands might differ depending on the platform you are running. Always refer to documentation for the specific commands for each platform. Once the NFS mount procedure is completed, create and copy the file from the server to the data domain backup directory to validate functionality. The specific commands differ depending on the platform you are running. Always refer to documentation for the specific commands for each platform. This lesson covers NFS task lists for IBM Spectrum Protect, overview of device class configurations, and implementation procedures. The goal is to integrate the data domain system using the NFS protocol to Spectrum Protect on a Linux OS server. To successfully integrate the data domain system into a backup environment, he performed the basic installation and configuration tasks shown. Proper installation and configuration are essential to proper communications. Step 1 is to install the Spectrum Protect application. 
In step two, the data domain system must be configured for Networker with NFS, and in step three, the backup server must be configured for backups with NFS mounts. Once the communication between the backup environment and the data domain system is established, you administer and operate the data domain system and backup servers in order to validate the implementation. In steps 1 and 2, perform administrative tasks such as creating a policy and configuring backup clients. Next, you run and monitor the backup job in the backup system's administrative console. You can also perform operations to perform backup recovery for a client system. And finally, you can validate and analyze the backups within the Data Domain System Manager where you can view statistics and reports. IBM Spectrum Protect policies are rules that determine how the client data is stored and managed. The rules include where the data is initially stored, how many backup versions are kept, how long archive copies are kept, and so on. The steps in the process are as follows. One, a client initiates a backup, archive, or migration operation. The file involved in the operation is bound to a management class. The management class is either the default or one specified for the file and client options. The clients include exclude list. 2. If the file is a candidate for backup, archive, or migration based on information in the management class, the client sends the file and file information to the server. Three. The server checks the management class that is bound to the file to determine the destination. The name of the IBM Spectrum Protect storage pool where the server initially stores the file. For backed up and archived files, destinations are assigned in the backup and archive copy groups, which are within management classes. For space managed files, destinations are designed in the management class itself. Four, the server stores the file in the storage pool that is identified as the storage destination. IBM Spectrum Protect allows disk type device classes to be defined in either file or disk type. File device classes are commonly used in IBM Spectrum Protect for virtual volume management. However, most IBM Spectrum Protect administrators define disk storage pools using disk device class definitions and associate formatted star.dsm files as storage pool volumes. File type device classes are recommended for use with a data domain system file device classes allow IBM Spectrum Protect to perform sequential read-write activity to files within a file system. Incoming backup data is written to a file and once a file is filled, a new scratch file is automatically created by IBM Spectrum Protect and is filled with additional incoming backup data. Perform capacity planning and measurement to ensure the data domain restore capacity is adequate for each folder. The default IBM Spectrum Protect max capacity value for a file device class is 2 GB. Depending on the operating system of the IBM Spectrum Protect server, maximum capacity parameters vary. This parameter is sized between 200 and 400 GB for data domain restore implementations. The default mount limit value is 20 and the maximum value for this parameter is 4096. This means that up to 4096 individual files can be opened at a single time. Each data domain restore instance supports up to 20 concurrent I.O. threads, so the default mount limit value is recommended. This lesson covers NAS best practices and data domain device types versus AFTD. This table shows some of the best practices when implementing the data domain system as a file system to Networker. Best practice for AFTDs is to create one per pool on a storage node and not to place more than one on a file system. The AFTD should be the only thing on the file system. For optimal SIFS performance, consider breaking out AFTDs by retention period and data type. This lets you track compression at a more granular level and lets you set up individual replication contexts. This table shows additional best practices when implementing the data domain system as a file system to Networker. 
Because SIF's AFTDs are single-threaded, throughput is limited to the capacity of a single thread, typically 40 megabits per second. To work around this limit, you can set up multiple AFTDs and direct simultaneous jobs to different AFTDs. Depending on the system size and the number of network interface cards, creating 3 to 6 AFTDs should yield good throughput. During a backup operation, the NFS or SIF share designated as the backup device receives the save set directly from the client slash storage node or backup server. In large environments, it is not likely that every client will have storage node software installed or storage node licenses available. For a large number of clients, it is likely that a small number of storage nodes serve as an aggregation point. The clients send their data to their associated storage node and the storage node backs up data to the share on the data domain system. This table shows some of the differences between a data domain device type and an AFTD. This lesson covers changing the default session timeout, tuning TCP IP parameters, and Active Directory requirements. Certain internal activities on a data domain system can take longer than the default SIFS timeout on the servers. This can lead to an error message during a backup. To avoid a premature timeout, change the SIFS timeout value from the default 45 seconds to 3600 seconds. To do so, open regedit and navigate to slash slash hkey underscore local underscore machine slash system slash current control set slash services slash LAN man workstation slash parameters. In the parameters folder, add a new D word value. Set the value name to SES timeout. Set the value data to 3600. With respect to SIF's performance, it is necessary to tune the TCP IP parameters on each server. Modify the Windows registry for the following, send and receive window, TCP window size. The modification parameters change slightly depending upon whether the backup server is Windows 2000, 2003, 2008, or Windows NT. The specific procedures for tuning of TCP IP parameters on Windows 2000, 2003, 2008 backup servers are shown here. Using the registry editor, create two new registry entries, default send window and default receive window. Also, create a TCP window size entry for the active network interface. For full details, download the SIFS and data domain systems tech note from the EMC support site. The specific procedures for tuning of TCP IP parameters on Windows 2000, 2003, 2008 backup servers are continued here. Add registry entries for different TCP IP parameters and restart the Windows server. For full details, download the SIFS and Data Domain Systems tech note from the EMC support site. There are several requirements for SIFS environments configured for Active Directory. For full details, download the SIFS and Data Domain Systems tech note from the EMC support site. In an Active Directory environment, the most common issues can be separated into two categories. Joining the domain, where the Data Domain System has trouble joining the Active Directory domain, and Client Access where the media server is unable to access the data domain system to perform a backup. To troubleshoot joining the domain issues, check physical and transport connectivity between the two components, mainly TCP connectivity. On the data domain system, check to make sure the time on the data domain system is within 5 minutes of the Active Directory server. Also. Check to make sure that the backup user specified on the data domain system is a valid user on the active directory domain with, at minimum, operator privileges. The command SIFS troubleshooting list users can help with narrowing down any issues.
To troubleshoot client access issues, again check physical and transport connectivity between the two components, mainly TCP connectivity. On the data domain system, check to make sure the media server host is allowed as a backup client. Also, check to make sure that there are no stale Kerberos tickets. This lesson covers NFS server performance tuning resources and hard mounts. Server tuning is recommended for new data domain system implementations using NFS. Keep in mind NFS mounting configurations depend on the NFS server type whether in an HP, Linux, AIX, or Solaris environment. In addition, Data Domain recommends hard mounts to ensure availability of the server after reboots or outages. Refer to the documentation resources available on the Supporting Materials tab for specific guidelines. The following examples describe NFS tuning for EMC Networker. Enter the following command, nfso-o nfs underscore use underscore reserved underscore ports equals 1. Mount dash o time o equals 600 nfs underscore server colon slash export path slash mount point. This mount command does not persist across AIX reboots. For AIX 5.2 or later, use the dash p option to mount the share permanently. If you are using NFS v3, mount the NFS share using this command, mount dash v NFS dash o l lock intr hard r size equals 32768, w size equals 32768, proto equal tcp, com behind timo equals 600, retrans equals 2, NFS underscore server colon export path slash mount point. To show the list of file systems exported by the data domain storage system, NFS show clients. In addition to optimize TCP IP performance on the AIX host, apply the following parameters. Set large send to no for each NIC interface. Other changes that will likely increase throughput. No-p-o sac equals 1. No-p-o tcp new ren o equals 0. chedev l Ethernet device on storage node dash A RFC thirteen twenty three equals one Chadev dash L Ethernet device on storage node dash A TCP node lay equals one Chadev dash L Ethernet device on storage dash A TCP REC V space equals two six two one four four Chadev dash L Ethernet device on storage node dash A TCP underscore send space equals two six two one four four NFS O P O NFS underscore RFC thirteen twenty three equals one. If you are using NFS V three, mount the NFS share using this command. Mount dash F NFS dash O R size equals thirty two thousand seven sixty eight W size equals thirty two thousand seven sixty eight hard NFS underscore server colon slash export path slash mount point. To show the list of file systems exported by the data domain storage system, NFS show clients. HP UX NFS additional tuning parameters. Add the following line to the file slash etsy slash rc dot config dot d slash nfs conf colon nfs client equals one num nfs iod equals twenty four stop and restart the nfs daemons with the commands slash spin slash init dot d slash nfs dot client stop slash spin slash init dot d nfs dot client start in addition to optimize TCP IP performance on the HP UX host, apply the following parameters. Set the TCP send and receive sizes for HP UX 11.0 and 11i backup servers. 
To make the changes persistent over system reboots, create a startup script that runs before the NFS auto mount. The numbering in the script name and location depends on how startup scripts are set up on your system. But as an example, slash sbin slash rc3.d slash s99dd. Enter the following two lines in the script. ndd dash set slash dev slash tcp tcp underscore recv underscore highwater underscore def 262144. ndd dash set slash dev slash tcp TCP underscore exmit underscore high water underscore def 262144. Mount the NFS share using this command mount dash T NFS dash O hard INTR NFS verse equals three. TCP R size equals 32,768. W size equals 32,768. BG NFS underscore server colon slash export path slash mount point. To show the list of file systems exported by the data domain storage system, NFS show clients. Mount the NFS share using this command mount dash f nfs dash o hard intr vers equal three proto equal tcp r size equals thirty two thousand seven sixty eight w size equals thirty two thousand seven sixty eight nfs underscore server colon slash export path slash mount point to show the list of file systems exported by the data domain storage system nfs show clients. Solaris system settings to improve TCP IP NFS performance. Create a file slash etsy slash rc3.d slash s90 ddr. Enter the following two lines in the file. ndd dash set slash dev slash tcp tcp underscore recv underscore high watt 131072. ndd dash set slash dev slash tcp TCP underscore xmit underscore high watt 131072. In the file slash etsy slash system, add the following lines. Set nfs colon nfs3 underscore max underscore threads equals 16. Set nfs colon nfs3 underscore async underscore clusters equals 4. Set nfs colon nfs3 underscore nra equals 16. Set rpc mod colon clnt underscore max underscore cons equal one set fast scan equals one three one oh seven two set hand spread pages equals one three one oh seven two set max pgio equals sixty five thousand five hundred thirty six note that sun t processor aka cool threads servers have notoriously bad nfs performance the only adequate resolution for this is to use jumbo frames This module covered how to install and implement data domain in a SIFS NFS environment, administer and operate backups in a SIFS NFS environment, NFS task list for Spectrum Protect, and EMC best practices for SIFS NFS servers. This module focuses on various options and procedures for EMC data domain implementation in a VTL environment. This lesson covers various options and procedures for EMC data domain implementation with a DD Boost option in environments utilizing several common backup applications. To implement DD Boost, you first prepare both the data domain systems and the backup application. Step 1. Enable the data domain system for storage operations with DD Boost devices by using the data domain CLI. Configuration can be done through the GUI as well. Step 2. 
Configure the backup application for use with the data domain system by using the backup application console. Continue with the DDBoost implementation by verifying backup and clone functionality. Step 3. Use the Backup Application Console. Configure backup operations. Step 4. Monitor backup activity. Step 5. Verify files on data domain systems. Step 6. Using the Backup Application Console, restore files from backup clone or client. This lesson covers various options and procedures for EMC data domain implementation in a VTL fiber channel environment. To implement data domain as a VTL with Networker, you perform the steps detailed on this slide. In most environments, FC zoning and HBA card installation and configuration will have been previously completed. Steps 3 through 5 are typically performed by implementation engineers and cover configuration of the data domain system, device discovery and configuration on the backup system's administrative console, followed by performance of normal backup administration and operation. This lesson covers SAN slash VTL best practices. The data domain storage systems can be configured with two or four 16 gigabit fiber channel ports for target mode SC attach. All connections to these ports are made via a fiber channel switch. Direct attachment of a device to these ports is also supported. The following recommendations apply when connecting the data domain storage system to a backup server via a fiber channel switch. When implementing a data domain VTL, use a fiber channel switch listed on the data domain FC switch compatibility list for the software release that is applicable to the specific data domain storage system. Because the data domain VTL provides LUN masking capabilities, consider using port zoning on the SAN switches. Switch encryption solutions are not supported by the data domain storage system. Limit FC extended fabric ISL link configurations to three hops between the backup server slash storage node and the data domain storage system. EMC recommends the use of persistent binding at the operating system level. This will prevent interruption of backup operations to the data domain storage system and difficult to diagnose problems after a system reboot. EMC strongly recommends turning off multiplexing in Networker so that backup data from multiple sources is not interleaved on the virtual tapes because this will significantly impact the duplication ratios. This module covered how to install and implement data domain in a DDBoost slash VTL environment administer and operate backups in a ddboost slash VTL environment, and EMC best practices for SAN slash VTL. This module focuses on a number of key concepts involved in the implementation of EMC data domain systems with application software. Upon completion of this module, you should be able to install and implement a data domain system in a VTL environment administer and operate a data domain system in a VTL environment, and implement a data domain system as NAS with IBM Spectrum Protect using EMC recommended best practices. This lesson covers various options and procedures for EMC data domain implementation in a VTL environment. Upon completion of this lesson, you will be able to describe a VTL implementation task list configure data domain for VTL, perform backup application configurations, and prevent multiplexing.
To implement Data Domain as a VTL with Networker, administrators can perform the steps detailed on this slide. In Step 1 and 2, install or configure the HBA card. In most environments, FC zoning and HBA card installation and configuration will have been previously completed. Steps 3 through 5 are typically performed by implementation engineers and cover configuration of the data domain system, device discovery and configuration on the backup system's administrative console, followed by performance of normal backup administration and operation. Data domain implementations all follow a similar workflow. To successfully integrate the data domain system into a backup environment, first perform the basic installation and configuration tasks shown in the diagram. In the first step, make certain that all installations have occurred, including installation of all application software, as necessary throughout the environment. An installation and initial configuration of the data domain system for proper network access by client systems and backup servers. Steps 2 and 3 are typically performed by implementation engineers. In the second step, configure the data domain system with the correct networking and create a backup user. Third, configure the backup server with the necessary credentials or other settings as necessary and create a share on the data domain system. Once the communication between the backup environment and the data domain system is established, you administer and operate the data domain system and backup servers in order to validate the implementation. These steps are typically performed by implementation engineers. The first few steps is to perform administrative tasks on the backup system's administrative console in order to create a backup job. Next, run and monitor the backup job in the backup system's administrative console. In step 3, you can also perform operations to perform backup recovery for a client system. And finally, in step 4, you can validate and analyze the backups within the Data Domain System Manager, where you can view statistics and reports. This task is similar to the previous task list. To implement DD Boost, you first prepare both the data domain systems and the backup application. In Step 1, prepare the data domain systems for DD Boost by enabling DD Boost and set the user. Then create the storage unit and SIFS share. In Step 2, configure System A for backup and System B for backup clone. This slide continues with the DDBoost implementation by verifying backup and clone functionality. Step 3 is to configure the backup slash clone operations. In Step 4, the backup management functionality allows the user to monitor activity. In Step 5, you can verify files on data domain systems A and B. Lastly, Step 6 shows how the user can restore files from the backup clone. Multiplexing interleaves backup streams, writing a little of safe set 1, then a little of safe set 2, and so on, so that none of the clients sending safe sets need to wait for the other clients to finish. The interleaving of safe sets has a significant impact on deduplication efficiency when the data domain device is used as a virtual tape library, VTL. Multiplex streams hinder the deduplication process from efficiently identifying blocks of common data because of the additional header information added to the data with parallelism. In order to realize the full benefits of deduplication, EMC recommends multiplexing be turned off when using the data domain appliance as a VTL. This lesson covers data domain implementation as SAN VTL with IBM Spectrum Protect best policies. The workflow for a VTL implementation varies. Step 1 and 2 is about HBA configuration and zoning. However, in most environments, FC zoning and HBA card installation and configuration will have been previously completed. 
Steps three through five are typically performed by implementation engineers and cover configuration of the data domain system, device discovery, and configuration on the backup system's administrative console, followed by performance of normal backup administration and operation. The goal is to integrate the data domain system using the NFS protocol to Spectrum Protect on a Linux OS server. To successfully integrate the data domain system into a backup environment, you perform the basic installation and configuration tasks shown. Proper installation and configuration are essentials to proper communications. Step 1 is to install the Spectrum Protect application. In Step 2, the data domain system must be configured for networking with NFS and in step 3, the backup server must be configured for backups with NFS mounts. Once the communication between the backup environment and the data domain system is established, you administer and operate the data domain system and backup servers in order to validate the implementation. In steps 1 and 2, perform administrative tasks such as creating a policy and configuring backup clients. Next, you run and monitor the backup job in the backup system's administrative console. You can also perform operations to perform backup recovery for a client system. And finally, you can validate and analyze the backups within the Data Domain System Manager, where you can view statistics and reports. IBM Spectrum Protect policies are rules that determine how the client data is stored and managed. The rules include where the data is initially stored, how many backup versions are kept, how long archives copies are kept, and so on. The steps in the process are as follows. A client initiates a backup, archive, or migration operation. The file involved in the operation is bound to a management class. The management class is either the default or one specified for the file in client options. The clients include exclude list. If the file is a candidate for backup, archive, or migration based on information in the management class, the client sends the file and file information to the server. The server checks the management class that is bound to the file to determine the destination, the name of the Spectrum Protect storage pool where the server initially stores the file. For backed up and archived files, destinations are assigned in the backup and archive copy groups, which are within management classes. For space managed files, destinations are assigned in the management class itself. The server stores the file in the storage pool that is identified as the storage destination. Spectrum Protect allows disk type device classes to be defined as either file or disk type. File device classes are commonly used in Spectrum Protect for virtual volume management. However, most Spectrum Protect administrators define disk storage pools using disk device class definitions and associate formatted star.dsm files as storage pool volumes. File type device classes are commonly for use with a data domain system file device classes allow Spectrum Protect to perform sequential read-write activity to files within a file system. Incoming backup data is written to a file and once the file is filled, a new scratch file is automatically created by Spectrum Protect and is filled with additional incoming backup data. Perform capacity planning and measurement to ensure the data domain system capacity is adequate for each folder. The default Spectrum Protect max capacity value for a file device class is 2 GB. Depending on operating system of the Spectrum Protect server, maximum capacity parameters vary. The parameter is sized between 200 and 400 GB for data domain restore implementations. The default mount limit value is 20 and the maximum value for this parameter is 4096. This means that up to 4096 individual files can be opened at a single time. Each data domain system instance supports up to 20 concurrent I.O. threads so the default mount limit value is recommended. This module covered how to install and implement data domain in a VTL environment. 
administer and operate a data domain system in a VTL environment, and implement data domain system as NAS with IBM TSM using EMC recommended best practices. To dig deeper into the many facets of implementation with application software, download application-specific documentation from the EMC support portal. You can also check for any recently added or updated documentation by visiting the EMC support portal. You can find additional documentation covering advanced topics on a few of the specific backup software products mentioned in this course by visiting the manufacturer's site. For product information, including overviews, data and specification sheets, and white papers, visit EMC's website at www.emc.com. For product downloads, documentation, knowledge base articles, and additional white papers, visit the EMC support portal. To find and enroll in follow-on training covering a wide range of topics, including system installation, maintenance, administration, and troubleshooting, visit EMC Education Services. Search for Data Domain to view a complete list of offerings. This course covered Data Domain implementation with EMC Networker and Avamar, EMC Protect Point, Veritas Net Backup, Veritas Backup Exec, IBM Spectra Protect, Oracle Recovery Manager, RMAN, and Commvault Simpana. This concludes the training. Proceed to the course assessment on the next slide.